Welcome to the Glass Lab podcast, where we talk all things product development. It's our goal every month to introduce you to the people, ideas, and development tools that are shaping the hardware products we all use every day. Hi, everybody. I'm the CTO uh, here at Glassboard. And on today's episode, I have with me uh, Grant Chapman, the CEO of Glassboard, and Ben Reitzman, uh, the CEO at the Battery Innovation Center. So, hi, Ben. Thanks for uh, coming on today and, uh, and talking to us a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to glad to be on, and uh, always uh, appreciate the longstanding friendship and uh, camaraderie, guys. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. We, we've known Ben for a long time, and uh, as I like to say, just a basically a fellow EV nerd, really at the <laughs> core. I mean, you, you do a lot more than that today, but I think. Uh, the love of electric vehicles and electrification and everything that exists within that space is just, I, I guess at this point, almost synonymous, at least when I think of, of who you are. So appreciate that. Yeah. It's uh it's fun. It's always been a, one of those drives pun mm-hmm. intended and um, you know, especially <laughs> with competition around it. So, you know, it started with kind of how I selected what I was doing from a university perspective as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're, awesome. I think is as much of an OG in this space as, as there are <laughs> at this point. So I think it's uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, no, I guess um, I, I just was a little bit curious if, um, you know, you want to talk a little bit about like, a, you know, the Battery Innovation Center. I think it's, I, I call it almost just a hidden gem. I mean, I think you guys, it's becoming more and more aware, uh, I think nationally, certainly due to due to your efforts and the folks over at BIC in general. But um, for, for, you know, people that don't know what the Battery Innovation Center is, maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, who you guys are, how you got started and, and you know, give us a little bit of the backstory there. Yeah, Q sales pitch, um, you know, so BIC... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Um, so Battery Innovation Center, and I'll, I'll, I'll say that I've um, been very privileged to be a part of now what's uh, what's a, a very short but uh, now really well-known long-standing history as we think about BIC, and we call it kind of BIC years, almost like dog years. Mm-hmm. You know, what happens in a few short years in the battery industry, you know, looks like, you know, 10 or 20, maybe longer in others. So Battery Innovation Center was uh, actually really originated by an energy systems network, um, Paul Mitchell, you had um, Chad Pittman, who was actually with the IEDC and was doing some work with Purdue University at the time. Uh, Brad Ellsworth, uh, who was part of uh, Southern Indiana regions, one of the what they call LIDOs, local economic development organizations. He was one of the agency representatives there. He was also with the utility company. And then we had um, Ian Steff, um, who was you know with the state as well, and IEDC came together uh, and were working with Captain Chuck Lasota, uh, and unfortunately. We've lost Captain Chuck Lasota since the founding, but Captain mm-hmm. Chuck Lasota and the group at Crane, looking at um, really a, an outpost from a Crane perspective. It wasn't only to serve Crane. I would say, you know, large focuses were intended to really serve our our warfighter, uh, NSWC Crane in Southern mm-hmm. Indiana, which is how we got placed down where we which were. Is, it's kind of funny. Again, I feel like that's something else that maybe not everybody knows, unless you're from central Indiana, that like one of the largest naval warfare centers is like landlocked right in the middle of Indiana, ironically enough. Yep. Yeah. It's, um, and, and I don't remember what the current stats are. Um, and I may be repeating, you know, this, this information, you know, ebbs and flows with bases. But it was the third largest, I believe still is the third largest naval base in the world. I believe it's the only still <laughs> landlocked <laughs> naval base in the world. Um, and, you know, anybody who's come through Indiana knows there's no oceans. I mean, we got... Monroe down there, but it's you know yeah. not quite an ocean. We've we've never lost a naval vessel at uh, Crane, have we? No, we've <laughs> never we've never had a naval vessel lost. Well, I don't know, maybe pieces of one. I just think they're all on purpose. Know. Yeah, I was going to say I think they're in purpose down there. So yeah. yeah, I mean they've got you know thousands of you know scientists and engineers, you know contractors, uh, along with you know service personnel that are there as an active base. Um, so we really were an extension for. The warfighters, they, they're really, that base is the, the center of power and energy excellence. They do a lot of other stuff, um, but they're really power and energy excellence. I mean, from electro-optics to portable power to advanced weapon systems to sensors and all kinds of and stuff. All, and that, all the generation, on-site, off-site. Yeah. Correct. All kinds of stuff that you know, obviously you can't talk about either, uh, but really cool stuff that's down there. And so they were looking for a way to, as the warfighter was looking for what's next, you know, they've really, um, really pivoted away from what used to be historically, and they still do a lot of this, you know, customized for the warfighter or, or even built for specifically for the warfighter. They just, you know, they aren't buying, they hadn't been buying commercial goods. It was always like, hey, I've got an idea for a widget in the military. I'll have it built. And it's like, it's and we're looking out in the, yeah, in the industry to say, hey, where could I take pots or commercial off the shelf and militarize mm. it? And so 
that's really what they started to notice with the battery is that their usage of batteries, their quantity of batteries is high need, high stress, high rail, high capability, you know, high uniqueness, but not to the point to where that they're going to be able to afford to buy, you know, a couple thousand of uh, advanced batteries. So they said, well, why don't we look at start doing commercial off the shelf? So that's really where it came about was to serve the warfighter to look at these advanced products. We were working with, you know, a few startup companies, about a half a dozen and looking at how they might take their products that are, you know, going into medical and automotive and into portable mm. products. There's some of those that were suited that look like for military. So why don't we militarize that? So that's really how the concept came so about. So you almost started as like a vetting or a development arm to take, you know, innovations in the commercial side and, and more or less like evaluate their use, like potentially in, in like a military environment. And then it right. kind of obviously morphed from there. Yeah. And, and, and the idea was to work with startups for sure and to, to advance the commercial industry. But there was at least a heavy tilt towards, uh, you know, kind of uh, the warfighter needs and mm -hmm. what they were looking at. So that's where we started um, in the late 2020, in the 2012 timeframe uh, under the direction of Captain Chuck Lasota and um, several of the crew that are there today. Um, it wasn't a big crew, but, um, you know, we had about a half a dozen other clients that we worked with that were all pretty much startups. Um, and then, you know, fast forward about a year and a half later and a couple of things happened. There was some, you know, some stuff that happened with, with the base and with some of the funding for the projects um, that didn't necessarily go away, but it went, you know, they had, you know, we were in the times of like a BRAC and a sequestration, which is kind of base reallocations There's funding reallocations, some of the projects funded. And so um, about the same time, uh, as some of that stuff was coming about, Captain Lasota got um, uh, just a you know just a random diagnosis you know through a, a checkup of uh, late stage pancreatic cancer, and so gotcha. I mean they gave him I mean it's one of those that pancreatic usually when they say they yeah. find it is late stage in most people, mm -hmm. and it usually is rapidly evolving and it, it I mean this is the um, life rate is pretty low like very yeah. very low and in his case it was less than less than I believe around ninety days. Wow, so, I mean, man. he went from running and water skiing and upright, you know, probably one of the healthiest guys I know at his age to like, you know, in the ER that fast. Um, I mean, it just rapidly evolved on his body. So unfortunate. Yeah. So between those, I mean, that's really unfortunate. And, and even the most unfortunate in all this is obviously we lost him because obviously a fantastic guy had served at Crane, you know, had served, uh, you know, I believe at least twice, uh, maybe more as a nuclear submarine captain. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, you know, highly regarded, um, very, very brilliant individual. And I think what he kind of laid the groundwork for BIC, uh, while the um, the, mis the mission was spot on, now the kind of the focus was, you know, starting to maybe fall apart, if you will, on, on or it wasn't the, quite the opportunity that maybe everybody thought it was. Mm -hmm. And so uh, myself and actually uh, another party, David Roberts, uh, who's now with the state of Indiana, were asked by some of the board members at the time to say, hey, would you guys come in and take a look at this operation? This is a nonprofit we've started in Southern Indiana. Here's what they were focused on, but you know, we're our our leader is uh, is in a really bad state, and our projects we're not really sure are gonna are gonna pan out. We've got you know, county's got a lot of money invested in it, state and others. I mean, there was a lot of parties that put in, you know, almost close to twenty million dollars to get the facility going. That we're like. Ooh, what's next? I mean, it was on a right. it was on a big freeze. Right. Well, sure. and and the facility was awesome. I mean, just to not bury the lead here, that oh, twenty million dollars was all cool toys for batteries and product development in in the battery and energy space. That like having been there, it is like Disneyland for engineers. It's like, oh, yeah. you have something to do this, this, and this, all three rooms apart. You're like, yeah, we can do all of that. Yeah, and it's such a cool atmosphere of like the best equipment you can need for the battery size yep. and lab projects and anything you're trying to do in the energy space, and. I'm kind of like leading into what I know you've done with it, which is it was for this very specific purpose that you and David then kind of pivoted that out to open the doors a little bit more to use it for just general like energy development. Yeah. And, and, and just, yeah, the quick round out on that, the great, great point Grant is, I mean, it was, it was purpose built. It was one of the first of its kind uh, anywhere in the world, frankly. I mean, right. at the time we were elite, I mean, there's a lot of other battery companies, but a lot of them, are, you know, maybe built for, assembling cells or they were reconverting factories to build assemblies, but nobody had really built a purpose-built full vertical facility, whether that was full scale or, or, you know, pilot, proof of pilot mm -hmm. scale that had anything and everything. I mean, you can literally come in with a, a material or you can come in without a material, come in with a concept that I want to get into batteries. Mm -hmm. We can walk you through the entire process all the way to I mean, 
you know, that pre-production, which is amazing. You how, know? how many facilities are there in the U.S.? Like open, I would say to, I don't want to say the general public. It's not like anybody can just walk into your like battery clean room, but, <laughs> but have those kinds of facilities that whether you're, uh, you Panasonic know, or, Panasonic or your uh, startup company with, you know, maybe 15 grand to your name. I mean, mm. I, I think that's one of the things, I mean, I, I feel like that's fairly unique, right? It's very unique. And, and um, as a, you know, Frankly, it's not a, com a competition model. It's actually as a, uh, as a complement model. You've got some as some national labs, some academic mm -hmm. labs now. Um, a lot of the universities have finally started to put, like University of Michigan, you know, Wildcat down south, RPI, mm -hmm. um, WIT, and Severs, several others have gotten um, some capabilities within the lab. But we're a complement to those, you know, not a, not a, a competition. That's because a lot of them focused on, like, advanced material research. So their job is to do the academic side and to do that that initial breakthrough, if you mm -hmm. will. But they're really not focused on how do we commercialize it. That was what that is what makes BIC so unique is how do we take that game changing breakthrough revolutionary, you know, pick your battery buzzword and actually repeat it more than once. And that's right, which, it's kind of the old porky pig talent scout is everybody can do this get once, but they can't do it twice or they don't know how to. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if, uh, for people that aren't, I guess, like in this space, I mean, I see emails come through like over Every the years week. all the time. Right. My, my dad is an engineer. He shares <laughs> stuff with me and, and he's interested yeah. in this space. And it's like, you know, always, you know, this is the next great breakthrough, right? It's going to make batteries that charge 10 times faster or a hundred times, times the better. capacity yeah. or, <laughs> you know, cheaper or whatever or, or energy density on par with gasoline. Yeah. I, mean, I, I hear like that one a lot. Every, every material science advancement is billed as the silver bullet for, for battery technology. And yeah. I think for, for people that have been around this stuff long enough, what you realize is that the actual material science breakthroughs, while impressive and certainly important and if, if you know, driven a lot of innovation that has made it into production cells, really, in my opinion, it's not the key, it's the commercialization, right? It's mm -hmm. does the um, in the lab idealized set of environment and circumstances pan out when you blow it up to, I mean, a lot of stuff even just doesn't survive basically like coin cell, right? That's and correct. I think that's why yeah. you guys have such an awesome capability there is to say, okay, you know, you think you've got this amazing idea, let's at least scale it up to a coin cell level and build hundred or a thousand of these things Correct. and test them and start to get some, you know, some actual real world data on the innovation. And can you repeat the technology? And even if you can repeat it, it was, oh, I can get into all the details, right? Cycle life. We, we could talk all day about that, but I, that's the thing that I think to me is really neat is your ability to very quickly take an idea in the lab environment and help people figure out like, does this thing, you know, really hold up once you start to to look towards manufacturing it in any sort of, of capacity, right? Yeah, that's, I use that analogy there, you know, the Porky Big Talent Scout, or we, we say Betty Crocker, the recipe book. Yeah, That's the thing is, again, if you ever saw the, the Warner Brothers cartoon or Looney Tunes cartoon, it was the fox who keeps coming in over and over and over. He's like, you know, to Porky Pig, and he's like, buddy, you got to see my skit. You know, it's like the best ever. So he keeps interrupting him all the time. And finally, he's like, fine, show me your skit. And, you know, he winds up blowing himself up as the, you know, the short term that he floats back down as an angel. And he says, that was great. You know, you're hired. He's like, there's only one problem. I can only do it once. And, 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 and I don't mean to knock a lot of the companies work with, but I think a lot of times as they come in, they're like, we've done it. We've kind of done it once and well, we've, we've got these announcements, the but they're like, uh, I don't know how I do it a second time. Whereas we start to do it a second time and work with them. That's when a lot of the ahas come out, which is like, yeah, I've built a few or I've built a house cell or I've built an electrode. Yeah. It's yeah. like, do you know you need the rest of the recipe? That's where Betty Crocker comes in. Is like, you've got great flour, but that doesn't make cookies. I can I can go grab a handful of flour and it doesn't taste like chocolate chip cookies. Right. I need yeah. the rest of the ingredients and I gotta be able to make that, bake that the right way. Well, and so. and that's the thing about batteries, right? Is I mean they all the all the pieces have to complement one another, right? Yes. Um, you know, it's superior, electrochemical, mechanical exactly. device. All of them play together. Yeah. Right. And I feel so bad for the chemists that come in with the entire chemistry story. Yeah. And they can make it in the lab and make this battery that is phenomenal. Yeah. And they take it to a real to real manufacturing and it just falls apart on this like on the spot and there's no fixing it. <laughs> yeah. Um because when I worked with you, because I used to work and help a company called called Polyceramics that had a great like technology they were working on. Um and a great theory and great lab results. And the moment I introduced them to you guys to help them commercialize it, because these were, you know, academic researchers that were amazing at chemistry. Oh yeah, they were very, they were really they talented. Are, yeah. And yeah. they just didn't know enough about how manufacturing worked to know whether their idea was good or bad or where to take it next. And I think that when I brought that business to, to BIC, 
and introduce them to you guys, you open their eyes in the first meeting more than they ever had in 20 years of doing battery chemistry professionally, academically, about how to make it. Yeah. And that's the magic that you guys have is you have this just built-in knowledge and experience in how to make the stuff that you can share with everyone so fast. I know they took their um, your battery short course. Yeah. And it was hugely important for them to learn all this stuff. So just want to plug the the knowledge that you guys plug in. Isn't the stuff you learn in school? Isn't the stuff you learn as a chemist? It really is the, oh, this is how you make it. Now the real world uses all this really cool technology. Yeah, that whole vertical, the commercialization is really what Bix about. Again, there's tons of other labs that, you know, as we look at roadblocks along the way with, you know, un unlocking material, getting the chemistry mm -hmm. sorted right, getting some of the mechanicals and others. We complement a, a ton of those folks, but then really, Bic, again, becomes kind of the Betty Crockers. Folks bring all the ingredients, or we help them bring all the ingredients ready to bake, and we help them bake that through so that we can, again, make one and make multiples of one that look the same and that there's a repeatable recipe. Now, we aren't a, com we aren't a commercial center, so we're not going to go bake that over and over again. We're not the Betty Crockers. We're not yeah. the yeah. Newman Bakeries, but, you know, we're, you know, we're- You're the we're, test kitchen. Yeah, we're the test kitchen, correct. And yeah. I think the the cool part, of going back to what you said earlier about it, it's not a competition with the labs, and it's no, not a competition no, no. with the, the companies you work with. You right. are a great cooperator and a great connector like Switchboard. What I've seen you guys do, like behind the scenes, which is really cool, this is a little bit like behind the scenes information is Ben and Vic does such a good job of taking companies that might have flour and some that might have sugar and some that might have chocolate chips. Eggs and butter and, and chocolate chips, and, yeah. And you bring them all to the dinner table and you're like, hey guys, you should all tell each other what you do because I can't because I'm under NDA, but you should all talk to right, each other. Right. And it's yeah. so cool that you are able to act in this capacity to be like, I know what you all do and you should all play nice together because you all have pieces of this puzzle that will be a great picture when it's assembled. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing that I think is interesting as well is I think that you guys have really, um, it's, it's, I feel like it's been a very iterative process, right? I mean, again, um, you say what you want about, you know, a public private partnership, whatever. Right. But I think the thing that again, strikes me as different than a lot of people, uh, at, you know, particularly the folks at the back yourself was certainly included is, is this process of, of iteration mm -hmm. and, and learning about like what works both from a lab sense, but also commercially, and then sort of like building upon that, right? So I think yeah. that's the thing that I saw was, you know, you started in just helping people get batteries made, but then it was almost like, oh, well, there's a natural uh, progression where, okay, once they start to build batteries, there's all this regulatory requirement around batteries and how do we now help them with that, right? And yeah. so I think again, it, like when you guys had announced that, you know, you're starting to do UL testing and now, you know, you're actually, I think a certified UL test lab, right? We are the UL best. Yeah. The battery energy storage technology test center. So, yeah. yeah. And again, it just, to me, it just makes perfect sense that you went that direction, but I think it also is key that it didn't start there. Like I think you guys basically proved out that there was enough customers, even within your own base before you kind of made that jump into saying, okay, like we're going to really invest in this next like level or whatever. Right. And they, yeah. again, I think is, is really interesting to me how you guys have basically started out from this entity kind of very closely tied to a military installation. And even I think relying maybe on some of their base capability, right. And then sort of developing your own, offering that into the commercial space and then, you know, bringing it up to today where again, you guys are doing a lot of the uh, validation testing and things as well, which I think is neat. So maybe we can talk a little bit about some of the services that you guys are able to offer within that space. Sure. And, and yeah, just to, to round out our earlier kind of the where, how big got to where they are today. I mean, um, we really took the mission that Bix, that uh, Chuck set up and then re readjusted that to focus on commercial entities. Uh, David Roberts and myself, you know, had some um, lots of car rides, plenty of conversation, uh, commuting uh, nearly 300 miles a day down there. You know, at that time, you know, sometimes six, seven days a week uh, with the team. We had lots, of, again, five plus hours to have a lot of conversations. We said, we think that this will work. Um, we just, the commercial industry has a big need for it. But can we re, kind of retell the message that when they look like, well, it seems like that was kind of military focused. They're like, well, there's a reason for that, but all the assets are stuff we need in the commercial industry. And so that was where we pivoted, you know, fast forward to today, you know, north of 500 customers that we've worked with globally, you know, active is in the hundred plus range uh, across all the teams uh, all over the globe. Uh, we've got a few here in Indiana that have been amazing clients for, you know, since day one, you know, Cummins being one, Eli Lilly and a couple others, but the, I mean, the balance of those are global. I mean, they're, if I mention them here, anybody who's listening or knows anything about batteries or got any technology device, probably heard of most of those names. And there's going to be a ton of them you've never heard of that are everything from, uh, you know, call it a backpack and an idea you know, all the way to, uh, or probably, uh, you know, a drop of, drop of electrode material on an idea um, all the way to, you know, the fortune 50 companies. I mean, they're huge. And there's, 
a bunch that when you look at, it, you're like, what the heck are they doing in batteries? Like Valvoline, for example. Right. So yeah, with the service as we work through for them, uh, you know, you you mentioned earlier, kind of we just kind of build upon that service um, scale is we do everything from the advanced battery build, and again, that's not materials, um, that's not materials discovery. We're really about taking those ingredients, matching them up with others, or taking that full ingredient set, finalizing that recipe and the capability and making that through from a, a battery build. That's up through, you know, multi-amp hour uh, pouch cells um, mm -hmm. or cylindrical cells. And then the testing and validation, it actually flows in naturally to that is because people want to know on their new tech what it's going to be capable of, what yeah. it fits in. You guys, is, I mean, Glassboard, you guys do so much stuff from a application perspective. It's always fun to bounce off application folks because we see new tech coming and people say, well, this battery like seems non-traditional. Is there anything that it fits? Like, hmm, actually, there's an application that's been begging for that. Right. And vice versa, you know, to say, hey, these are applications that are needed. So maybe your tech doesn't line up to electric vehicles, but maybe it lines up to sensors. Maybe it lines up right. to portable products. Right. Or maybe it's drones. Maybe it's, you know, insert thing that has a medical need. Medical, where... mil yeah, all kinds and of that's, stuff. That's the thing about batteries, right? Is, I mean, in, in some ways, it's it's the foundation of the of your of your tech gadget or your, your device, right? I mean, it's it's not super sexy. It's a lot of times below ground or behind, <laughs> you know, most of the time. And it's the first thing that goes bad, so everyone hates well, them, yes. right? <laughs> With and, most and the only thing that makes any news today is EVs. Like, people don't realize, yeah. like, just sitting here, I've got like seven or eight batteries on me that are not electric vehicle right. grade or rated. Like that's not the point. And it used to be that I think people were more aware of that, right? Like when batteries were removable and they weren't, you know, soldered in or, you know, glued in or whatever, yeah. right? To the tech today. And again, it's just shrunk that much that you, you almost have to do that, right? But it, to me, again, it's like your, like a, what most people don't realize is that like, even like your iPhone could probably do 10 times more than what it can do today, but it is, it's basically all of your features and functionality is is tied to the battery that's in that device. The power system, right? yeah. And we, were, so, we were talking about your iPhone and you're right into work today, right? Yeah. You're, you're at your e-bike and use your phone for maps and some stuff. And what was your expected battery life on that? Like, oh, I mean, it was. I was burning through it, right? I mean, I got the screen brightness up. I had a little bit of music going. GPS, you know, GPS running. GPS going. Bluetooth. Yeah. yeah, all of it, right? But it, I mean, it, it you know sucks down you know forty eight percent in about an hour ride, right? Um, and, and frankly, if you look at what it's capable of doing with its size today versus even five years ago. Right. I mean, it's amazing. So, I mean, there's, and to your point, there's been, yeah. you know, you get these breakthroughs, but there's been incremental that's been pretty solid incremental. And, so. and that's my whole favorite pitch where everyone starts doubting the battery. And it's like, oh, I've been waiting for my great electric car battery for 20 years. I'm like, well, the cool part is it's finally here. You just didn't hear about it because it's been four or 5% a year yes. every single yeah. year for the that's last 20 correct. years. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, there's no big breakthrough. There's no big yeah. press release, but go compare today's battery versus 10 years ago, even. Right. And it's yeah. night and day. I remember when you, we were first buying batteries from you at Underdell for a go-kart startup. <laughs> yeah. Compared to what I can go buy now, it is completely different right. technology. And it's amazing how fast it moves, but there isn't this big public like acceptance of it. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, unfortunately, batteries aren't Tesla stock. They're more like the Dow, <laughs> you know, just yeah. kind yeah. of yeah. steady, well, steady, you know, uh, progress over if, the years. If, by, by the way, so my background is electronics, which I think you guys know, and coming from a circuit board manufactured, it's very similar to batteries. I mean, it, I mean, literally like nearly cookie cutter, except for you're adding in the, uh, the chemical side. We had electrical and mechanical. Mm -hmm. And actually, at the raw card level, chemical plays into that. But it's not a dynamic device once it's made. Now the battery is... But I look at that like everybody took for granted. I mean, you guys design electronics. Mm -hmm. Amazing how many take for granted that what they think is a green card that comes out of a copier. In fact, like forget the assembly that's on it. Literally just, just the, the circuit PCB. board. Yeah. The PCB, most people, I'm amazed how many electrical engineers have never, ever, ever been through a circuit board process. They don't know how like a basic four-layer, you know, multi-layer right. board is built. I'm like, and they're blown yeah. away when they walk through and they're like, oh, that probably would have like changed my designs, changed how I implement stuff. And how I lay out circuitry and how I do digital and all the other stuff on there. I'm like, yeah, that would have been nice 30 years ago for you to go through any circuit board operation and see yeah. what's happening. Right. It's, I'm, it, I'm still waiting for that prototyping process to get to desktop 3D printer status because it's getting there. It's it's not there yet. Sure. And the tech is But just coming. like circuit boards, batteries have advanced, but circuit boards, I mean, look at what's oh, going on today now. and what is capable inside of like your headphones and your cell phone yeah, and everywhere else and playable devices. Flex rigid, multi-layer. It's and crazy. Like the, the thick copper ones for like the EV, like inverter stuff is some of my favorite. Yeah. Yeah, there's like bus bars embedded in a printed circuit board. We're, yeah, we're, we're working with a company that moved from um, on their, it's battery related, but on their battery management system, we would call them advanced power controls or mixed hybrid power controls. Now it's got a fancy name, but um, you know, they've got implanted um, their um, 
implanted transformers. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the board, they actually use the okay. copper inside. All the copper windings that traditionally would be in a transformer are inside there. And, you know, the magnet, you know, the inductors. Yeah. And, and they're perfect is, every time. Yeah, they're the exact same. Yeah, I mean, they're they're even better than mm -hmm. a wound and the failure rate goes to like zero. Now you got to design them in. But it's amazing just to see that where before we used to put these big honking transformers on. Right. So, yeah. You're right. Battery is... Battery is really moving along in that three to four percent, five percent, some it's, leaps every year. And it's every year. Up, yeah. That's my favorite part. Yeah. It's not like there's a year off. Like someone does something Correct. in the market somewhere that makes it into production. And it's super cool. Yeah, either manufacturing, um, and again, back to that whole electromechanical chemical device. Well, I think everybody's half waiting the time for not chemistry. the breakthrough <laughs> chemistry. And we're seeing like I mean, like tablets and like going to the tablets in internal mm -hmm. layers were a drastic impact to what's happening with a cylindrical cell. The new right. cylindrical cell impacts and how they basically package it together. Right, that's how you assemble it. It was a drastic impact to standard, yeah. what we'll call standard chemistries. I mean, that alone were, were big breakthroughs. So mm -hmm. kind of funny how you can play with all those models, but yeah, only the chemistry one, again, seems to make news and only EV seems to make news. I don't know why. Yeah, it, at so. least Tesla for all the other like noise they make in the market, they do a really good job on their battery days about saying like, this is what we did this year that is really cool. Yeah. And it is the nitty gritty mundane stuff that they pump up and like everyone gets excited about it because it's going to make the stock go to the moon. Yeah, everybody loves the EV thing. I always laugh too because as an automotive supplier for all my years on electronics and just like on batteries, I mean, they were the ones um, willing to do anything that it took to get you to tape a dollar bill and ship it to them. Like, so, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're doing everything you can on electrification and everything is like free. I mean, that's their favorite buying yeah. word is free. Like if you say it's free, they love you. You know, then <laughs> you get in these other industries and they're like, well, they don't even talk water or dollars per kilowatt hour. You know, if you tell them, by the way, this sorts out to like $3,000 a kilowatt hour, like, I don't care. Uh, yeah, I, need I need that it. for the app. If you said $3,000 a kilowatt hour at any OEM meeting right now for your next battery technology, right. yeah. You are going to get hung. Somebody's going to shoot you and take you out in the street. Yeah. That's not <laughs> wasting their time in the meeting. That's correct. They're yeah. like, wait, when you said three thousand, like pesos or something? Yeah, you it was like, just like per like gigawatt hour, like yeah, like <laughs> under three dollars a kilowatt hour. We yeah. can do that. But in yeah. some cases, I mean, it's a good thing when you start to talk about commodification sure. of batteries because it means that they're actually to the point where they're actually being talked about, yeah. being used at the scale at which commodities are are used at scale, right? Yeah, um, where they become like electronics, where they become right. Penny yeah. parts, right? I mean, what as an R and D, you know what it takes to put together a prototype, right. and then you watch that in production, it becomes a. And I still don't know how a one dollar board instead of a one hundred dollar right, board. Right, I still don't know how automotive does it. Like laptops, <laughs> I get other industries. I get where like the economics work in. I just don't know how you buy that many pounds of equipment in a car for that much <laughs> money. Just dollar for pound ratio blows sure. my mind. It's that's incredible right. what those guys that's do. That's why they love the word free. So yeah, as close as you can get to free. Well, that's yeah. why they love software. I remember when I was at Delphi, they're like, "Oh yeah, the software is free." I'm like. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'll get in. Anyways. Oh man. No, it's, it's super cool. And I think the other thing that I've enjoyed about our relationship over the years is like, you, you're so involved in, you know, what I'll call battery technology and innovation. Mm -hmm. But then I think also like the tie in like back to the actual like applications. And I think again, one thing that I feel like has given you a unique perspective over time has been like your involvement in, in motorsport, right. As you know, um, early on, you know, uh, different people doing like land speed records with, uh, you know, electric motorcycles, um, Richard Hatfield comes to mind there yeah. um, with, with lightning motorcycles. But that's the other thing that I think at least initially kind of drew Grant and I to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously we came up through um, EVC racing when we were doing, you know, electric karting, which is kind mm -hmm. of, I think really why we hit it off probably at the beginning yeah. was just that love of, of kind of electric vehicles and motorsport. But that's something else that I just really do appreciate. And I think is, is kind of cool uh, your involvement there. So again, I don't know if you're still involved in that stuff much or can talk about a whole lot of it, but it is, it is something else that I think is neat about your story, right? It's, it's just, just that interest and love there. Yeah, that came from, uh, you know, when I was younger, um, racing, uh, started in go-karts and then um, started racing motorcycles and then actually start, got, on, uh, got into off-road, both, uh, you know, two wheels and four wheels. And then um, that competition factor is what, um, again, just kept me, Busy, you know, like kept the mind running for me and gave me a chance to push the limits, which I liked. Uh, and frankly, it gave me a way to push the limits and not get in trouble, um, which is probably <laughs> what I've been doing. If I wasn't doing that stuff, I can assure you with ADHD that um, I always say, if I don't direct that in a good way, it'll wind up doing bad. And so I try to find stuff to fill it. But that's what brought me into, from a college perspective, when I went in, was working full time as electrical engineer, uh, or sorry, as an electrician to pay my way. Um, had a a uh, friend of the family that I was working for him, uh, running crews and learning electrical work. And that's what kind of pivoted me actually from, I was looking at either going into uh, uh, cooking. I was going into culinary or actually into ROTC, uh, into the Navy was uh, had 
started the sign up efforts. And, um, you know, he started to really get a, a spark for me, pun intended. I wound up, uh, you know, looking at Purdue and Purdue had, when I talked to them about what do we have that's around like motorsports and racing at the time, they didn't have the programs they do nowadays. They said, you know, we've got this really cool um, electric vehicle, you know, it's a solar car. And I'm like, okay, how fast is it going? I think they told me at the time, like, like 18 miles so an hour. It's like 30 mile an hour or something, the top speed, you know, like downhill with, with, wind. You know, with somebody like me inside of it. And I'm like, oh, great. I'm like, anything fast? And they're like, well, we're, IUPUI is kicking around this program around, you know, potentially doing electric Indy cars, you know, with, uh, with Lola and a bunch of others, there's going to be a bunch of universities and we're like, okay, the formula lightning series is really what got me really attached to EV for the first time was, which was back in the nineties and had, um, a bunch of other electromechanical engineers, chemical folks that, um, again, that was an extracurricular at IUPUI. Yeah. You know, we, we got a lot of we got some really cool stuff I and mean, we got to work with the impact and EV one engineers. We were yep. working with very early prototype impact EV one, the very first lead acids, the nickel metal hydrides. So I'm like tying all this stuff from high voltage and electronics yep. and electro like you talk about feed the monsters that are inside my head. Tell me, get up and run around the room. They were all busy. They're all yep. like, Oh man, like give me more of this. Right. So I could keep them distracted. So I've had the, Again, a very fortunate since that time to basically look at anything that I could that's competition. But if it has electrification or hybridization, I'm all mm. about it. From motorcycles, boats, speed boats, uh, airplanes have been a part of the last I counted uh, about 260 um, world records and national records, uh, either helping build those systems, consult on those systems, building them myself, my father in law and I. Yep. You know, did uh, land speed, built several land speed bikes. One of those was a two-week venture. He got bored and decided, he's <laughs> like, hey, I want to take an old junk junk bike and turn it into electric and go race it at the Bonneville Salt Flats in a few weeks. And you're like, how many is a few? And he's like, two. Yeah, yeah. so we, we did that one. That was pretty cool. Um, you know, still has that one. Uh, and then up through, I met a lot of a lot of fantastic people. Again, just like racing, it was a big mm -hmm. family. I've had, the uh, again, the privilege of meeting a lot of really cool people and dealing with a lot of projects. And it's out on that outer edge because competition, you're already expected to fail. Right. I think that's what's cool about EVs is like people expected to fail anyways. And you kind of blend that with EV, which is like EV isn't competitive in their opinion. But we were always out as the underdog, which is like, yeah. not only do we not go out, we never, everyone I was a part of was never, let's just go show EV has its place or EV does its thing. We were intentionally like, we want people to be like, that's the future. Right. Like, like whoa, EV, the, cool. even what they do is they leave the others behind. And so the majority of those competitions have had the privilege to say that they bested the best in that competition, not the best of electric vehicles, right. but actually the best. No, right. Right. So. I think that's huge. I think that uh, for better or worse, I think, you know, batteries and, and EV tech got sort of associated with, you know, the eco or environmental movement. Not that there's anything wrong with that, Correct. but I think there, it lacks a certain amount of, um, general appeal, right. Mm -hmm. Or attention yeah. that kind of goes along with that. And I think, I mean, obviously I think Tesla gets a lot of credit for sort of, you know, taking EVs to the masses, but I they, think even, they created a beautiful car that everybody loves. And right. most people I'm amazed at how many folks that were going to look at them and driving them mm -hmm. that didn't know they were electric. They're like, yeah. well, I want the version that my neighbor has. I don't know if that one's electric. Cause I don't know. If I've ever seen him plug it in. They're like, yeah, they're all electric. They're all electric. Well, but that's yeah. the thing is they made a great car. And even from and a performance electric. standpoint, right. it, it was, it's amazing. And they still, a lot of times are, I still think they have the fastest like production car around when it comes to, when, to acceleration. I right? think compared as a car now, you don't see them. Now you it's see them in electric vehicle. comparisons, yeah, but it's just a car, but, but they, they get viewed in all kinds of other car comparisons mm -hmm. against, yeah. you know, German performance cars, performance sedans, like all the above. It's no longer like electric versus, you know, but ICE, which is cool. But I do, I feel like the seeds of that, of that changing were probably there in the early, like in the mid 2000s into like Agree. the, the yeah. early mm -hmm. 10s. I think it really started to become that the cool e thing. Like you were saying, like EVs aren't just this thing that go into a, you know, into a Prius, right? Uh, you know, nickel metal hydride pack, right? Yeah. Enable that technology. But it's like now all of a sudden, great you see selling, people, fantastic. I mean, a great selling, fantastic A to B car. Don't get oh, me wrong. Yeah, no, it's still my is. Is like three hundred thousand miles on it. It's an yeah. incredible car. Yeah. But to see you guys slamming, you know, 
giant lead acid batteries in into IndyCar. Uh, an Indy car or nickel metal hydride. I mean, I remember like going 200 plus mile like, an hour with it is pretty crazy. You guys have like linebackers on the football team, <laughs> you know, literally, you know, unloading and yeah. loading 200 pound lead acid cells. If, if you get on YouTube, I'm sure yeah, you, know, actually, you can, you can uh, find it for the and folks and out so there. So this it's is for amazing. the electric JAG program. I mean, I actually found some, and been some a, vintage photos. Oh yeah. That, oh, yeah. You get us on this, we'll put it up as B-roll here yeah, in the show. Yeah, so yeah. I'll, have to, I'll have to make sure I get that up as B-roll oh, footage, but you've got... So this was actually, oh, come on and get it to work. That was our car. I mean, yeah. that was working with Delphi. Um, you know, my first electronics career was at Diversified Systems. You know, right. we were the lead sponsor for the team, myself and father-in-law, uh, who's now, him and I did a bunch, you know, done land speed racing together. Yeah, It's really, really cool. I mean, at the time, people didn't think you could take, you know, a couple thousand pounds of lead acid batteries. And throw it around a track. One go fast, let alone what I laugh at today is, uh, you know, I've seen some competitions where they're like, well, we don't know that we can change out batteries that fast because uh, it's like a 300 pound battery. Oh, pack. Formula E gets just really grinds my gears when yeah. they don't allow that. And they're like, and I don't know if we can do it that fast and safely. I'm like, we're changing 400 volt packs in sub modules, college kids that yeah. had no formal training. In fact, maybe a year in, we finally learned like maybe we ought to work with one of the pit crews. So players racing sent some folks in mm -hmm. and actually some of our guys started getting involved with them. You know, they showed us how to like do a real pit and we were doing pits in less than 30 seconds at that time. And we got, you know, down to not quite any car pits, but enough that where they were, even their crews were impressed with what all were moving. Well, how with much you're swinging. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. And, and again, that was with frankly vintage tech. I mean, it was all, you know, very, very vintage. Well, tech. And back then it was custom. It's oh, yeah, like we built, we, we built and designed time, all in those order, college kids. In right. order, like a DC, DC converter that would give you your voltage Correct. conversion. You, you guys built everything yeah we we um you know the ev1 system again brilliant and frankly high performance at the time uh, we worked with the engineers i mean they what's you know what cracked me up is they're like hey we know that you can rewind to do this if you use this pattern in the motor and we know what it'll pick up and right over to ohio motor works with jeff and crew and he's like we do this to the water jacket we can get more flow that'll let you pull it out you know, we we did you know things like putting uh, by the way we pumped helium through the motor yeah which was rather interesting to people we would start doing um, uh, medical grade helium we we blew through the motor Just to chill it out yes to chill yeah. it down and then we did hydrogen one time blew hydrogen through it which wasn't such a good idea we did <laughs> yeah. blow flames you guys didn't you yeah. skipped that uh, chapter on the Hindenburg in, yes. in uh, high school didn't you <laughs> hey you know somebody told us <laughs> that we blow cheaper. it over the rotor you know the rotor stack yeah. that it would actually super cool and we're like ooh that sounds oh, super cool I know yeah. it's cheaper than helium but yeah it's got yeah. some bad ideas that go with it yeah oh, the awesome. treasurer said they didn't have money for the helium anymore so they went yeah, out they, they, went the, they went for right. hydrogen yeah nothing like carrying around a small hydrogen tank and blowing uh, blowing yeah. hydrogen through the orbit anyway, what I think is back to that competition stuff yeah I think what's important is is for those not just the the sandbox and the ecosystems, but again, like the competitive ecosystems. I think yeah. not only just just having a reason to do it, but actually be able to like this competition allows you to basically push the limit, right? And yeah. like it, it gives you a, a motivation to go for the best, right? And 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 really push the performance of the technology, what's out there, like all of it, right? I mean, yeah. the the fact mm -hmm. that you can swap the batteries and that pit stops are important, but also straight line speed, you know, all of these things holistically. Um, again, it has a way of, of shaping technology that I feel like doesn't necessarily always exist within a laboratory environment or a pure business environment or, or whatever the case may be, right? There's all these extra constraints um, that get put on you when you start to, you know, deal in those spaces. And I think it's really important to preserve a certain amount of just like, let's like, let's try it. Let's, let's try it and iterate and break it and innovate and, you know, where you can do that right. and, and be safe about doing it. But you know, be able to take a little bit of, of risk um, out there, I think is, is super cool and important. And it's something that I hope that we continue to preserve in, in the future, right? Yeah, yeah, and I love what you guys did, by the way. I mean, when you guys came in with the electric uh, uh, go-kart, mm -hmm. amazing. Because again, a lot of people had electrified stuff and electrified go-karts, but they were just really boring. I mean, you guys- They were, they were projects, right? Like, yeah, they were projects. And it's like, oh, I can convert an internal combustion engine. I mean, you guys made something that in very, I would say Tesla-esque, mm -hmm. which is- you know, form, fit, function, the whole deal plus, uh, you know, competitive. I mean, that was, it was beautiful, by the way. I still have a picture as one of my, <laughs> one of my favorite, like mini EVs. It's still yeah. the back of the Because it, it doesn't, it didn't look like a science project, even yeah. though I think it kind of was at the time, yeah. right, yeah, for, for you sure. guys. So brilliant job on that one. Well, I think oh, for us, the whole thing was, how do you scale this so that someone will adopt it because it's cool and because it's fun? Yeah. And our, our favorite example of that is just the whole shot that those go-karts can do compared to regular go-karts. Yeah. 
you have all this torque from zero RPM, which go karts yeah. do not have. Correct. And you could put someone in it, like Sean Hendricks, who we'll have on a later podcast. He's a big guy. Yeah. And he could still rip that around the parking lot and just grin ear to ear. And I think that was the, the most fun thing about that is turn this thing that is commercial. People buy gas go karts to go race. Oh, sure. Yeah. And how do we convert this, you know, what started out as a collegiate competition to a product you could go put on the shelf and people could then adopt into the EV ecosystem, but not be an expert. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That was, that was a brilliant piece. I mean, yeah, and I think it really opened a lot of eyes. Uh, I'm sure you guys know. I mean, people were you know not sure what to take of it. They go out to an EV Grand Prix or go to yeah, some yeah. of the other test events and everything, and they're like, holy crap. Like, These can move, yeah. This is crazy. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and I think it was. I mean, in, in some ways, I think it was, like many things, it was probably a little bit early for its time, right? But I think even now, I mean, you and I are looking at, I mean, I think like EV karting in Europe is really going to, it's, gonna, it's, it's yeah. picking up. It's very much going to be a thing. I think, you know, Formula East continues to be a series that, you know, exists and, and there's new people entering and things like mm -hmm. that. I think McLaren just announced next year they're getting in uh, involved with Formula E. So, I mean, I think there's there's tons of, of additional avenues out there again. Um, but no, I think, you know, as it pertains to product development, I mean, truly, I think battery technology, um, even if most people don't realize it is, again, it's, it's so pivotal, right? It's pivotal yeah. for electric vehicles. It's pivotal for uh, wearable tech, whether that's watches or earbuds. I mean, it really is at the end of the day, we're almost to the point where for the most part in technology, what you can offer a user in terms of like features almost always comes down to the battery. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, yeah. um, we had the, the hammerhead folks on, I think uh, a couple episodes ago, again, like, like their product, again, at the end of the day, a lot of conversations are centered around what kind of features can we offer the user and what, how does that impact, you know, the battery life and the runtime. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very much at, the the forefront of most companies minds when they're when they're designing products is like how are we going to use the battery is it going to be safe you know how many times can you can you charge it how fast can you charge it you know it's, it's basically there's all of these knobs that you have to turn right so <laughs> yeah again, back to be, that electrochemical mechanical device yeah, it may yeah. not be right. the sexiest thing but again i think particularly in in the product development space it's such an important thing right um i'm really glad that you could you could come on in today and, and talk to us about it all i think it's really cool what the battery innovation center is doing again i feel like a lot of this stuff does happen behind the scenes so hopefully um you know and i, I know you're always trying to do this the more i think we can like push and make people aware of the fact that battery innovation center exists and um the fact that you guys are really helping push pretty much everything forward, right? Everything from the chemical and the low level uh, battery tech to manufacturing processes, to finally just just helping people get good battery tech to market by mm -hmm. doing the, the testing and the UL certification piece. It all makes a lot of sense to me. And, and I think is really something that is amazing that does exist literally like in our backyard here um, in Indiana, which, which is all pretty neat. And you mentioned the connectivity piece. I mean, frankly, that's what we try to tell people over and over again is, it isn't that Bic knows everything. It's that we try to know everybody. Mm -hmm. So uh, we become a funnel from an industry perspective. In fact, that's why we're set up as a nonprofit. By the way, everybody always asks, well, if you're a nonprofit, how does it work? You work for free. No, we are very much pro-revenue. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so don't, yeah. we, don't, we don't interact for free, um, you, know, just, uh, you know, just like a contract yeah, manufacturer. But, but um, we have a ton of folks that come through that, frankly, uh, never, what I would say, physically do work with Bic. Right. They do work within the ecosystem. And by the way, that's not just here in Indiana. I mean, we're, we're connecting people all over the globe. Uh, it really yeah. doesn't matter where it's at. So, you know, people that are needing tech, you know, needing another part of their recipe, yep. folks who have a part of the recipe, but then need, you know, or uh, have a capability, but then are looking for application. Or an application that's looking for a battery. I mean, this is my thing we haven't touched on. That's my favorite part of calling Ben is not only can I call him about chemistry questions or, or the <laughs> nitty gritty. I'm like, so I've got a client that's building a thing that has these really weird power needs, X, Y, Z. And he'll go, well, I know battery company A, B, and C, and each one of them might fit some of it, so let's introduce them. Yeah. And it's such a powerful story that's such a, like, quick shortcut yeah. for these guys, you know, going through traditional sourcing channels for batteries. You know, they're going to get the, you know, commodity battery sold to them 99 times out of 100 before they find one supplier that's got the one magic cell, yeah. right, for their application. But it enables, enables people just to, like, switchboard that in and out. Yeah, it's... I appreciate that. And, and um, that's really the thing. I, I would say we don't have anything like a secret sauce. It's not like we have the secret Rolodex and we hide that from everybody. In <laughs> fact, I mean, you would find that most of our companies, you know, who work with us or engage with us find that we're like, we're handing them that black book if there is one, mm -hmm. which is, but, you know, really what I'd say the biggest thing Bic does is we're actually trying to help folks get away from being agnostic. Mm -hmm. and, and agnostic comes in two ways, but battery agnostic, I hear of agnosticism, Frankly, if I hear one more OEM or somebody say that they're battery agnostic in their design, I'm going to shoot them in the foot or choke them. I'm like, 
one, you're just as bad as the people that are agnostic because they're on they're not knowledgeable enough. And I say uneducated, that sounds maybe wrong or unknowledgeable. They're they're not knowing enough to realize that, yeah, the gains they're gonna get by optimizing for their application. Yeah, because everybody has a great data sheet and says that their battery is the best for everything. I don't care who it is, pick a manufacturer. <laughs> They'll say that their battery will fit in everything. It goes everything from a cell phone to your Tesla to, to your airplane, drone, yeah. yeah, to inside of your body. Like, and it's all the one cell. It's like, like the double A of the world, and that didn't work either. Um, is we're really uh, helping people focus on, and really we're forcing the industry to be intentional. We want you to be battery intentional, and that's whether no matter where you're headed with your battery or what you're looking for in a battery. So. Please do, I, if I could wipe any word, you know, game changing, buzz through or breakthrough and all that, like that'll stay with the industry. But if I could at least get away from people using agnostic and say, we're being battery intentional. Does that mean there's only one capability, only one solution, only one manufacturer? No, that's not our job. You know, we're not gonna tell you that Samsung or A123 is the best for everything, so go use them. We're gonna help you be very intentional, which is like, here are the chemistries, here are the capabilities, here are the folks that exist in that space, to your point, here are the folks that have the capability today. Here are the folks that are close mm -hmm. and with some adaptations. Or here are the folks that are in that refinery stage right now that you ought to get with them because they can probably build that into their model mm -hmm. and take advantage of it. So rather than being agnostic, which winds up, I would say more often than not, the reason people don't get the battery they want is because they're agnostic. And like if I could wipe that word yeah. off the damn planet for batteries, that would be that's amazing funny. to drive you to intentional, which would be right. very, very intentional. And that's... That's what we do is Bix trying to drive you to being intentional. And I think with it, us. I think there's so many parallels, like particularly from where I sit, like in mm -hmm. the product development space. I feel like we spend probably as much time helping people develop the features that they want in products as much as we spend time helping our customers realize which features they actually like shouldn't want or shouldn't develop mm -hmm. for, right? Because it's kind of a similar thing because I think when people come into the product development space, they're like, okay, I want a, you know, a product that is you know, looks great and has like, you know, 10 hour battery life and has all these awesome, amazing features, you know, it does all of these things, check right? Check every, check every yeah. piece of the spider chart. Like, and, yeah, like, like, corners they, of you know, like yeah. and like you're saying with the, the agnostic approach, it's like, it's, it's, it doesn't exist, right? Yeah. Um, you, you just, it's not, it's not actually feasible to say that that's what you really want, right? Whether you realize it or not. And so it's then it's like, okay, you know, trying to understand the use cases, you know, what, you know, the, the customers that you're trying to sell for, what features do they care about? Which ones are most important? And I feel like there's just a lot of parallels, right, to, uh, you know, finding, sourcing, building, you know, battery technology, right? It's truly not that there's one size fits all. It's that there's, you know, people that are better suited for certain applications than there are others, right? Yeah. And I think that's what's been unique about you guys as well. Again, back to what you did with electric vehicles. Again, you guys were very, with your um, cart and others mm -hmm. you've done, you know, bikes and all the stuff along the way. And I think you've been very intentional in kind of the selection and how you put those together. I think that's been the unique thing about Glassboard and, you know, watching some of the projects that you guys have gotten involved with, helping drive people to, yeah, to quit, you know, having vanilla products. Right. Because, you know, unfortunately, vanilla products, you know, don't usually do, don't usually go well. And, you know, it's hard to adopt where, you know, you start to be intentional about your products. It's amazing where you can get what you can do. So oh, now people sure. latch onto those. I mean, I think that's, again, Tesla did a great job of being very intentional. You know, he was not being agnostic that we're gonna create another car company, try to be everything to everybody. It would be very, you know, you know, I don't know that I agree with everything Elon does, but I'm sure he doesn't <laughs> agree with me either. But I think there's a lot of brilliance in what he did. And you know, even battery intentional, he was trying not to be, you know, agnostic. He was intentional about what they selected. He was intentional what they were trying to get out of that cell. Does the, you know, the cylindrical have its limitations? Yes. Did the one that they selected then have some issues? Did what they were doing with the car? But he was very intentional about what he was trying to but achieve looked, with that. They looked holistically end to end, Correct. right? On yeah. what could be done, what could be man, mass Correct. manufactured. And even if, if it meant that they had to take, um, you know, a non-optimal solution is, you know, potentially like the packaging, right? It's not super easy to package that many fifties in a pack, but that was tell you from having done it. But that seven was seven to right. seven to nearly 10,000. Yeah. But they that's, had, that's they couple. had to give that up in order to, to basically build something that, that was going to be mass manufacturable at the right? time. Yeah. At the time. And, and, and think, they're, you know, and they're iterating on that now, right. And they're doing different things as far as packaging are mm -hmm. concerned because they now are able to, right. I think realizing at the time, that, that that was a constraint that they weren't going to be able to work around and not wasting time, effort and energy, um, you know, moving an entire industry that was designed to build that particular package. Really, I think at the end of the day is what enabled them to actually like get to market with with a product. And again, the same exists within, I would say, more traditional product development processes like 
realizing early on that like you have to make important decisions, you know, about what features to keep, which ones to develop on is, is always super key. So. And it's, it's when do you stand on the shoulders of giants and when do you go out in the blue ocean and innovate, right? Yep. And yeah. you, you can't innovate your whole product. If your entire product <laughs> is blue ocean, the likelihood of you succeeding is really, really low, right? Yeah. You're never going to market on time, on budget, and your product's going to cost too much. But man, if you can innovate one thing, Blue Ocean, that's the key thing, the intentional thing you think your customers or clients will love and, and embrace about your product, go stand on the shoulders of giants. Ask Ben for the hottest battery tech. Go <laughs> ask, you know, uh, Qualcomm for the best, you know, like SOC and things like that. But innovate on the thing that you can do great yeah. and stand on the shoulders of giants for everyone else. Again, in product development, my tool set works the same way. Glassboard sends some really cool innovations on some process and some stuff, but do I do it all in-house? No. I use Autodesk. I use Forum Labs. I use these great companies that give me great products that allow me to do the one thing I do uniquely very, very well. Right. Yeah. yeah, you're right. You mentioned that ocean thing. Yeah, it's easy to go out too far in that and you just drown. Yeah, you can't yeah. make it to shore. Yeah. yeah, you just drown. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Cool. Well, Ben, again, I really do appreciate you taking the time today to, to come talk to us about, you know, Battery Innovation Center. Um, again, I'm, I'm sure we'll uh, we'll probably have you back on to talk about about a million other things that you do. So this is maybe just a small, many. small look into, you know, uh, uh, what's in what's in the the Ben Reitzman stable? But I think we I think we should do an EV racing one. We should we should talk about sure. some of the crazy stuff that oh, we've all done. Hundred percent. How we've got involved. You know who we've ran yeah. into. I mean, there's some. Yeah, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a tight knit family in a lot of ways. It's yeah. Amazing how many I, I you know there's those degrees of separation as I said about being intentional and you know, Grant mentioned about making introductions. Um, I always believe that you know, was it seven degrees or five degrees? Yeah, the Kevin Bacon number. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm actually I'm a firm believer that if you in, you know, 30 minutes with people, there might be like one degree of separation. I'm finding yeah. more and more that I, even this weekend, I had a conversation with a softball coach. Um, another one of just happenstance, I'm out watering some fields for my, for my kids before we coach. And this lady walks up, she goes, you look really familiar. And I'm, I don't recognize her from Adam. <laughs> and she's like, look really familiar. And she's rattling through a bunch of stuff for a few minutes. Like we're trying, everything works and all this stuff. And she's like, I don't know. And I hear her walk away and her daughter's playing. So I walk up. And her daughter says, gets talking on something. She goes, is that your motorcycle? And I said, yeah, that's my motorcycle. She goes, that's pretty cool. She goes, you own bikes? I said, yeah, I've ridden them and I've raced electric and done some other stuff. I used, I said, I used to race, you know, I did some sprint car and other stuff as well. And her mom turns around, she goes, did you say you've done like car stuff, like sprint car and other stuff? I said, yeah, I, I did some stuff and did some stuff with, you know, Indy, with a little bit with, you know, car esque S. She goes, did you ever come to Winchester Speedway? And I'm like, yeah. She goes, my family owns Winchester Speedway. And I'm like, I that's know the know. entire yeah. family. I'm like, I have flipped the <laughs> golf cart on turn three yeah, that's at great. three o'clock in the morning when a bunch of us were racing out there when we were doing electric setups yeah. with the yeah. uh, with the IUPUI car. She was the little girl that was up front. She was she was running the stands. Her dad, that's so funny. her dad and her grandpa, you know, own Winchester Speedway. I'm like, it's been years out there. I went up there when Neymar started racing and we were doing racing. I'm like, this is hilarious. So we, awesome. we, you know, then we wound That's up fantastic. connecting all the dots yeah. for like all the racing stuff. So, anyways, it's you wonder again. Literally, a few minute conversation turned into yeah. We know all kinds of folks, which is pretty well, cool. Maybe that'll be a, a future show. I definitely, I don't think you'll have to twist Grant and I's no. arm to talk more, uh, you know, <laughs> EV nerds. and or motorsport stuff. Yes. But yeah, thanks again, Ben. And uh, yep, we'll uh, we'll catch you guys in the next one. Yep. So, um, Grant, thanks. Drew, thank you very yep. much. Oh, yep. Thank you. Yep. Take care.